And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Chef Canarsi. Mob Talk Radio. This is Jeff Canarsi. Today we are going to talk about Jimmy Burke. Uh, obviously, if you've seen the film Goodfellas, uh, you know who Jimmy Burke is. Uh, he was played by Robert De Niro. Uh, and we can argue whether or not that's really a fair representation of who Jimmy Burke was. But I think looking at who Jimmy Burke is uh, as a character archetype anyway. I think it's safe to say that De Niro played him a lot more safe uh, and probably a lot less violent than perhaps Jimmy Burke was in really real life, of course. So we're going to kind of talk about Goodfellas a little bit today. Uh, I'm going to try to just kind of keep it to Jimmy Burke as much as possible. But the reality is, is that Henry Hill is a liar, always was, always will be. Uh, he made himself out to be somebody he really wasn't, uh, but I don't want that to be really the crux of this story. But if you are using Goodfellas as a reference for who Jimmy Burke was, then you really don't know who Jimmy Burke was. Uh, if you take Henry Hill's word for it or the, the film uh, Goodfellas, it's not really an accurate representation. Uh, I think the film did a good job in the sense of the, the violence was real. Uh, very realistic. A lot of the street stuff was realistic, but at the end of the day, Jimmy Burke was a lot bigger uh, than that film really portrayed him. Uh, the, the film sort of made Henry Hill the the main topic, and and while I understand that at the same time, it it, it doesn't lend credence to who Jimmy Burke was at the end of the day. And Jimmy Burke was a very very tough man uh, that had a very rough childhood. So we're gonna get into Jimmy Burke. Uh, in just a few minutes, uh, but I wanted to talk about the, the Gotti trailer for just a second. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about it other than I liked it. Uh, I watched it a couple hundred times, believe it or not, honest to God. Uh, first viewing, I wasn't too keen on it, but a lot of it was I needed to see where they were coming from, what angle. And what a lot of people may or may not understand is, is this is coming directly from uh, John A. Gotti Jr.'s uh, book, Shadow of My Father. If you haven't read that book, definitely go out and get it. It's a great read. A very solid read, a lot of truth in it, a lot of bluntness. Uh, he doesn't hold anything back. So I think if you, you go out and you read the book, then you'll kind of understand the perspective and, and where this film is coming from. I thought Travolta looked incredible. I thought uh, he carried himself well. And it's going to be interesting to, to see. You can never really take a two-minute trailer and you know say to yourself pass or fail because a trailer is only showing little snippets of different events uh and from what i understand they're going to use a lot of uh sort of backdrafts and stuff like that uh in the film so i think as a whole it, it may not be to the extent of say like casino or, or goodfellas or something like that but i think the story itself is going to be incredible and i think you're going to see really an inside peek uh, at the Gotti family from the perspective of those who are involved, not some book author who's running around making assertions or uh, taking the FBI's word for things. So I think it's going to be a good film. I'm eagerly anticipating it like everybody else. A lot of people are, are trying to compare this to the Gotti movie starring Armand DeSante, and you really can't compare it. There was a lot of things that were wrong with the film Gotti that HBO produced, uh, not knocking Armand DeSante in any stretch of the imagination. I thought he did a good job. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, what what tends to make biographical movies better is when it comes from the horse's mouth. And this film is going to be from the horse's mouth. So if you didn't like the trailer, don't give up on it. I, you know, like I said, two minutes is very, very difficult to really show or encapsulate somebody's life in two minutes. So I was impressed with it. I thought it was shot well. It looks good. Uh, the acting looks pretty good. So I, I think it's going to be good. And uh, everybody just kind of needs to hold their horses and wait till it comes out December 15th. Uh, and it's going to be terrific. And, and don't forget that A&E is coming out with a Gotti family documentary that they all took part in. And I think that is really going to be uh, 
an important watch, especially if you're into mob genre and stuff like that. You're going to get a lot of the truth and stories from the family. And, and that's – some may argue that things like that could be jaded, but I don't believe it is. I, I think you're going to get the truth uh, from them, and I think that what is going to make it truly unique is that some of the things that you've heard your whole entire life aren't true. Uh, and they're going to set the record straight, and I think that's going to be a great, great watch. And, and I think the film's going to be good too. Uh, but a lot of people, you know, are jumping the gun a bit. But a lot of people aren't either. So it goes both ways. But I was impressed with it. I thought it looked good, and I'm excited for it. So we're going to take a short break, and when we get back, we're going to get into Jimmy the Gent Burke. <laughs> And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are talking about Jimmy the Gent Burke. If you've ever seen Goodfellas, uh, Robert De Niro plays Jimmy Conway in the film. And this is exactly who we're talking about. What a lot of people don't know. Uh, and I need to preface this. And the reason why I'm going to preface this is because a part of sort of what I do, and it's not necessarily with this genre, but I always try to look at what sort of makes people who they are like what events in their life sort of leads them down a a certain path as it were uh and if you don't know jimmy burke he really had an awful childhood um there are things that happened to him that shouldn't happen to any child uh there are events that were out of his control and i think some of these things are eventually what uh sort of led him down the path that he did take uh and so there's always with mob guys, there's there's two sides of it. There's the person that's out on the streets making money, and then there's the person at home. And by all accounts, Jimmy Burke was an incredible father, loved his children very much, uh, took care of his adoptive parents, would help anybody who needed help. But then on the off side of that, there's the business side of Jimmy Burke. And the business side of Jimmy Burke was, you will do what I say or else you're going to pay the consequences. And that's the truth. Uh, and most mob guys don't bring work home with them. So you will categorically hear time and time again that mob guys all, you know, always seem to have a Jekyll and Hyde personality. And with Jimmy Burke, it was no different. Uh, and we are going to talk a little bit about Henry Hill as well. I, I think that's a valid thing to discuss. Uh, I particularly don't care for Henry Hill very much uh, for, for multiple reasons. And I, and I also think Nick Pileggi, who wrote the book Wise Guy, tended to believe a lot of the things that Hill said that just really have never been proven and sort of kind of kind of remind me of Sammy Gravano in a lot of ways. The only difference is, is that you know Sammy Gravano could earn money and wasn't really a junkie, whereas Henry Hill couldn't earn a dime and was a junkie. And, and that's just kind of the way it is. So let's get into Jimmy Burke. Jimmy Burke was born James Conway, July 5th, 1931, in the Bronx, New York. He was the illegitimate son of Jane Conway, who was actually a prostitute. Um, Jimmy never knew who his father was. Uh, at two years old, his mother left Jimmy on the steps of an orphanage. The orphanage, the orphanage that he was dropped off at was run by Catholic nuns, and he never saw his mother again. So if you can imagine a child at two, year, two years old um, just being dropped off at an orphanage, never, never seeing your mother again, and just saying, hey, best of luck, kid. I, I can't take care of you. Somebody else will. So during his youth, uh, he was shuttled between different orphanages, different homes, uh, he ended up suffering physical, mental, and sexual abuse at the hands of many different foster fathers, foster brothers. Uh, at 13, he was riding in a car with another yet foster father, uh, and there was a wreck and his father was killed. And, and what specifically happened was Jimmy was acting up in the back seat of the car, and his foster father turned around and gave him a smack to shut him up, and there was a huge accident. And as a result of the accident, uh, the, foster fa the foster father died. And effectively, as a result, the adoptive mother blamed Jimmy for her husband's death. 
Uh, and she beat on him daily, and then eventually social services stepped in and removed Jimmy from the home. So as you can see, already by like from 2 to 13, Jimmy's had a horrible life. Uh, the idea that he suffered abuse in, in any extent uh, is absolutely tragic. Uh, the fact that a child acts up in a seat and the father you know, reaches around to give him a little smack to shut him up, and then there's an accident and he dies, and... You know, the, the adoptive mother yells, screams at him, beats on him every day and blames him for the death. I mean, that's just I cannot imagine on any level uh, what that did to Jimmy Burke, uh, you know, and that, that's what a lot of people don't talk about. They 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 look at Jimmy Burke's life as a whole and they say, all right, well, you know, he became a gangster and and there was murder committed and stuff like that. But, but there's also this other side to Jimmy Burke that a lot of people don't know. And, and this is truly one of them. And when I was doing my research, it, it was sickening some of the things that I read that he went through. Uh, no child under any circumstances should ever have to go through that. And so there is a part of me that says, well, and you wonder why people do what they do. Uh, you can look at serial killers, and I'm not making the 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 statement that, that Jimmy Burke was a serial killer. I'm not I'm not trying to make that correlation. But what I'm saying is is that you know most of the time when you look at serial killers, they they always have a certain set of what they call the triad. Uh, bedwetting, physical, sexual abuse, mental abuse, et cetera, et cetera, uh, detachment disorders and stuff like that. So the idea that, that Jimmy Jimmy Burke's childhood was rough really isn't a surprise to me, uh, and, it, and it's unfortunate and it's sad. So after Jimmy's removed from uh, the last set of family, uh, he was adopted by the Burke family. Uh, he ended up growing up in Rockaway Boulevard and Ocean Promenade in Rockaway, Queens, uh, and by all accounts, he really loved the Burks. They were really good, really, really good to him. Uh, and as Jimmy got to be an adult uh, and sort of went to a life of crime, he would always make sure that they were taken care of financially for the rest of their lives. Uh, and by all accounts, from everybody I talked to and, and from the things that I was able to read, he was really happy. So whatever had happened between 2 and 13, you know, he finally lands in a home where there's some stability, some love, and some caring. Uh, and you would have thought that that maybe would have been enough to sort of guide him along the path. But ultimately, in the end, Jimmy made uh, some other uh, decisions that would leave him down a life of crime. Once Jimmy reached his uh, teenage years... Uh, he begins to get in trouble with the, the police and, and ends up spending a lot of time in jail. In 1949, at 18 years old, he was sentenced to five years in prison for forgery. Uh, he was passing counterfeit checks for Dominic Sersani. Um And one of the things that happened early on, and it's sort of weird because if you go back to Goodfellas, there's a scene where Henry Hill you know, gets caught legging cigarettes, refuses to rat on everybody, comes down the stairs, hey, you broke your cherry, and everybody gives him money. That was probably directly stolen from what happened in 49 to Jimmy Burke. Uh, when Jimmy Burke obviously gets arrested for forgery, uh, for passing checks for Dominic Sersani, he ends up getting five years. And he effectively tells the cops to go fuck themselves uh, and refuses to testify against Sersani, which ends up impressing the local mobsters that he's sort of around. Uh, and once he goes to prison, he ends up befriending a lot of uh, mob guys and, and sort of gets to know them real well. So there was obviously uh, a friendship that was formed in prison that he would obviously continue to have once he gets out of prison. Uh, after his prison sentence, he ends up joining the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. Uh, he didn't necessarily like it, um, according to what I was told, and, and, and this is subject to opinion uh, because I can't factually prove it. But from what I was, from what I was told, he didn't like the job. Uh, he got the job through some mob guys, through union work. Uh, but he repeatedly beat the shit out of union bosses and anybody who disrespected him. And he, at six foot three, two hundred and sixty pounds, he was nobody to be messed with. So obviously, that wasn't going to be the job for him. And that's when he sort of decides to leave the nine to five job and break the law because there's more money in crime than there was at the time doing construction. And at least that was his point of view. Uh, in the 1950s, Jimmy was making a lot of money distributing bootleg cigarettes and liquor. Uh, the other facet to Jimmy's activities were hijacking. There was nothing that excited Jimmy Burke more than stealing and hijacking trucks. Uh, early on, Jimmy realized that bribes and payoffs were truly a necessity, and therefore 
one of the, the unique things he, he did was he was able to bribe police, judges, cops, attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. And it enabled him to function in a way where he could stay sort of off the, uh, sort of off the radar. Uh, those who took the bribe were safe. Those who didn't, he, he murdered. That's the bold-faced truth. If you didn't take a bribe from Jimmy Burke, he was going to kill you, and that was the end of it. Uh, according to the FBI, once again, this is according to the FBI, uh, they claim that Jimmy Burke was responsible for killing more than 150 people. I find that a little hard to believe. They say 20 to 25 a year. I'm not really sure if it was really that many. Uh, Henry Hill sure as hell couldn't substantiate that either. Uh, in, in fact, Jimmy Burke was only ever convicted of one murder, so... I find it a little hard to believe that the numbers were that much, but like I said, sometimes people get attributed to things they, they weren't involved in, or sometimes they get attributed to things because they're in a circle, a larger circle. So is it true that he killed that many people? I would say no, but you know, like I said, this is coming from the FBI, and you know, I think I can go on record as saying the FBI is not always honest themselves. Uh, Jimmy's relationship with Lucchese crime family pretty much goes all the way back to when he was 16 years old. Uh, when he was 16 years old, he had already become a contract mob killer. Uh, he worked for several families, but mainly the Lucchese crime family uh, as a mob hitman. Uh, and one of the things he did early on was essentially, and this is a little disturbing, but but from what this is also, I, I got to preface this too. This is from Henry Hill, that effectively he had said that Jimmy Burke, one of the one of the tactics he would use when it was a, a, a hit job was he would force the, the someone's children and someone's family to watch him kill their family member to send a message that this will happen to you if you don't go along with, with what the narrative is. Once again, that's kind of from Henry Hill. Uh, I could not I, I saw this information a little bit somewhere else, but there really wasn't anything in court documents that says that this was true. So once again, we sort of have to go tongue in cheek here and, and either say, all right, Henry Hill's being honest or he's lying. Uh, I think the reality is, and I and using street judgment here, I doubt very highly that Jimmy Burke would do something like that. Uh, I don't think Jimmy Burke would hurt a harm a child for anything in his life. That wasn't the guy he was. However, I also will preface it by saying that in that life, uh, you don't want eyes on what you do. So I doubt very highly that that's necessarily true. And I also think that Henry Hill will go to any extent he can to make someone look like a monster because he was scared of the people around him. And we'll get more into that later. But I, but I just wanted to be very clear on that because there's a lot of web pages and a lot of articles that claim that Jimmy Burke was some sort of monster. And he would hurt children. He locked children in refrigerators as a sign of you're going to do what I want or else. I, I don't think anything, any of that's true. I think a lot of that is spurned, uh, spurred out of legend. And I think a lot of that is was designed by Henry Hill to make Jimmy Burke look uh, probably more insidious than he was. Because after all, Henry Hill needed to get out of going to jail for drug trafficking. So it, it sort of makes sense. But does that mean that, that Jimmy Burke in any sense of the word was an easy, soft man? Absolutely not. I mean absolutely not. Uh, there wasn't really a racket that Jimmy wasn't involved in. Uh, and one of the unique things that he actually did was he cut all five families into whatever rackets he was doing. And I think that that offered a bunch of uh, unique things for him. One, it gave him protection. Jimmy was a hell of an earner, was able to make a ton of money. And any time he was in anybody's territory, he cut that family in on what he was doing. I don't think it was necessarily out of respect. It, I think there was some respect involved in that, but I don't think that was the end game for him. The end game for him was to uh, simply make as much money as possible. And if he cuts in the other five families, they'll protect him and they won't, won't look to come after him. And I think that's a highly intelligent move. And that's something that uh, we've probably seen uh, probably seen copied by other people throughout the years, but it seems like that was really uh, what he did, and he was very well respected uh, by all the mob families. Uh, so as Jimmy begins to make more money, uh, he eventually starts to see, you know, he kind of is going to need his own crew, and really the the the, the closest of his guys uh, was obviously Tommy D. Simone, Henry Hill, and Angelo Seppi. And those were his closest allies out of the crew that he had. Uh, the Burke crew uh, pretty much worked out of South Ozone Park, Queens, <clears throat> and East New York, Brooklyn. So they, they ran out Bed-Stuy, Park Slope areas like that, and also in South Ozone Park, Queens. Uh, and what they eventually, what he has them eventually doing is hijacking trucks, uh, stealing stolen merchandise, uh, 
Uh, and then they start to sort of move into JFK and hijack more trucks out of there. And it was a pretty tight operation, uh, and they were able to make a lot of money. Uh, he continued to bribe officials and cops, and then what would happen as a result is uh, the police would come to him, and they would let him know if there was a possible informant or if there was a potential witness. And usually, according to the FBI and Henry Hill once again, uh, that the way that Jimmy Burke would deal with this is by killing them. They consistently found 20 to 25 bodies a year, which would be found tied up, strangled, and shot, and left in the trunks of stolen cars, and usually were found abandoned in the parking lots adjacent to John F. Kennedy Airport, which was essentially, according to the FBI, Jimmy Burke's calling card. Uh, he didn't have patience for informants, didn't have patience for rats, and the one way that you handle information from getting out is effectively silencing them. Uh, and I think what lends itself to the idea that that is probably a probability to some extent, maybe not 20 to 25 bodies as the FBI has claimed or Henry Hill, but you also have to look at Jimmy Burke's run. Uh, Jimmy Burke went for a long time without doing a ton of time. Uh, and there's a way that, that, that you do that. We could use Greg Scarpa. He's a horrible example of this, but Greg Scarpa dealt with informants and people who talked a certain way. Whitey Bulger dealt with informants and people who talked a certain way. There's a reason why they're able to be on the streets other than having FBI protection. Uh, it, it's by disposing of your problems, and that was one of the things that Jimmy Burke had no problem doing. He ends up buying a bar in South Ozone Park, which, is, which was called Robert's Lounge, uh, and him and his crew would operate out of there. It was also a popular hangout for everybody that was a criminal. Anybody who was anybody in any criminal aspect could be found at Robert's Lounge. There was a lot of scheming going on. Uh, Jimmy Burke even ran a multi-million dollar bookmaking operation out of Robert's Lounge. And also in the basement, he would have high-stakes poker games. Uh, we've seen some of this on The Sopranos with the high-stakes poker games in the, uh, the hotel. And effectively, in the basement... Uh, they would have high stakes poker games and, and Jimmy Burke would take a cut of that just to ensure that there was safety and et cetera, et cetera. But that was another way that he made money. Um, so with money coming in, Burke tried, Burke essentially realized he was making too much money and he needed to bury it into legitimate businesses. And one of the things he did was he bought a dress factory in Queens called the Momo Vetus, which was effectively just like a dry cleaning business uh, and a side to a dress factory. And it essentially just allowed him to launder the money a bit and just sort of keep his books straight. Uh, Paul Vario was really, at the end of the day, one of Jimmy Burke's best friends. Uh, they had business ties together. Uh, it, he was enabled essentially through Paul Vario to, to do what he did uh, because of Paul Vario. I, I think that had he not had the support of at least Paul Vario, I think Jimmy Burke might have run into some problems. In 1972, uh, Jimmy Burke and Henry Hill traveled to Tampa to collect a loan for the union boss, Casey Rosado. What ends up happening is they went to Tampa to collect money that was owned to, like I said, the union boss, Casey Rosado, and they end up beating the living hell out of uh, Gaspar Giaccio. And they ended up even tossing him to the lion's den at the zoo. And, and if you go back to the Goodfellas scene, it shows him going down there, putting the guy in the car, beating the piss out of him. Well, it turns out that Gaspar's sister worked at the local branch of the FBI, and she ended up going there and, and effectively telling on uh, her brother and telling on Jimmy and Henry Hill. And as a result, uh, both Henry Hill and, and Jimmy Burke were charged with extortion. Both were convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. After about six years, Jimmy Burke gets out of prison, and he goes right back to the streets. The same thing kind of Henry Hill does, uh, who was released just shortly after Jimmy Burke. And what ends up happening is probably the beginning of the end for Jimmy Burke. Uh, you know, Thus far, up until this point, Jimmy Burke had probably spent close to 11 years his whole entire life in prison. Um, and the thing is, is, is while Henry Hill was in prison, he began selling drugs. Uh, and as he gets out of prison, Henry Hill decides he really, really wants to start the drug business and get it going. And, and you see it in the film Goodfellas. Uh, so essentially what ends up happening is he goes to Jimmy Burke and they, they start to kind of talk about the drug business a bit. And uh, what ends up happening as a result is Jimmy gets involved in the drug business. And he knew that the Lucchese's did not want him selling drugs. Uh, he knew that Paul Vario... Uh, 
did not want him selling drugs. Now, here's the thing. and We've talked about this a million times before. It's not a problem with the profits. It's a problem with there's too much time and too much heat dealing with it. So it might have been handled differently, say, if Jimmy Burke was a a lender or he provided the financial assistance for people to attain drugs but didn't directly like involve himself and he ends up directly involving himself which ultimately at the end of the day is really going to be his undoing and it's only his undoing because Henry Hill not only is using drugs himself but ends up getting caught trafficking which is going to lead directly back to Jimmy Burke which is going to put Jimmy Burke away but that's sort of the beginning of the end for Jimmy Burke. But in the meantime, December 11th, 1978, Building 261 at the Lufthansa Cargo Terminal, JFK was robbed for $6 million. Now, over the years, we've heard $5 million, $8 million. Uh, The numbers I got were 6 so it's got to be somewhere between 5 and 8 so maybe 6 6.5. Uh, and sort of, I want to run down how this all went down. Prior to the robbery, Lewis Werner, who was the Lufthansa cargo supervisor, he owed a huge gambling debt to Jimmy Burke, a Jimmy Burke controlled bookmaker named Marty Krugman. Uh, so essentially, Werner owns, owes money to Martin Krugman, who is pretty much controlled by Jimmy Burke. And so because he owes money, there sort of needs to be something else that happens. So because he works inside of JFK at Building 261, perhaps he might have a tip that uh, could help them get in. So he ends up taking the tip to Tommy D. Simone. Um, the plan was originally designed by Tommy D. Simone, uh, sort of as a gut reaction on how to handle uh, a situation with someone owing Jimmy Burke money, he, you know, without Jimmy having to kill anybody for it. Uh, then what ends up essentially happening is Burke hears about the tip, hears about the plan from Tommy, as well as uh, Martin Krugman, uh, excuse me, not Martin Krugman, but Lewis Werner, and effectively Jimmy Burke plans and recruits a crew which involved Tommy D. Simone, Angelo Seppi, Louis Cafora, uh, Joe Manry, Robert McMahon, and Paolo Lacastri. Uh, Jimmy's son Frankie uh, was brought in to drive the crash car. Uh, Pernell Stax Edwards uh, was brought in only to drive the stolen van uh, from Queens back to New Jersey to a junkyard at a car compaction joint. Uh, that was his only job. The, the, the film Goodfellas sort of makes Stax Edwards look a little bit uh, more important than he was. But really, at the end of the day, his only job was to pick up the van when it was done and drop it off uh, at a car compacting place. Uh, now, we have to talk about John F. Kennedy Airport for a second. Uh, at the time, and we're talking about, oh, what, 78 or whatever, um, what ends up, what, what I'm show, really trying to get to here is that John F. Kennedy Airport was really controlled by two crime families at the time. Uh, it was controlled and divided essentially between the Gambino crime family and the Lucchese crime family. So if you were going to hijack anything at the airport or you were going to steal anything from the airport, you not only had to get permission from the Lucchese, but then in turn you would have to get permission uh, from the Gambino crime family. So to do anything, you got to get permission from one and then get permission from the other. And usually if you got permission from one, if the other got a cut, they were okay with sort of how it went down. Now, there's been a lot of talk about how John Gotti and Jimmy Burke were friends, and I'm here to tell you from the horse's mouth myself that they were not. Uh, They did know of each other. Uh, There were times they did spend together, but it was a business thing, but it wasn't like some of the media and some of these book writers uh, talk about. One of the things that has been mentioned time and time again is the murder of Tommy D. Simone and how John Gotti killed him. That's not true, and I will get into that uh, because that that's sort of an important thing. Uh, John Gotti had nothing to do with that, regardless of what Goodfellas wants to say about Billy Bats in that situation. At the end of the day, and, and then you know what, I'll just clear it up right now. Tommy D. Simone obviously killed Billy Bats. Everybody knows that. Uh, but what the and of course Billy Bats was a member of the Gambino crime family. And according to what other people say, which is not true, God, John Gotti was incensed, wanted revenge, this, that, and the third. Really, at the end of the day, here was sort of the deal. Uh, 
once the robbery at Lufthansa was done, Jimmy gets real paranoid, and anybody that was associated remotely with this was going to be killed. Ultimately, at the end of the day, Tommy D. Simone was killed for no other reason than he knew too much. Uh, it had nothing. It had little to do with the Billy Bats. That was a part of the spoke of a huge wheel. But the reality is, is that Tommy D. Simone had to go because he knew too much. He was a loose cannon. Uh, there were murders that were attached to him and Jimmy Burke as well, and Jimmy just didn't like loose ends, and that's the reality of it. Uh, there's been a lot of stories about what happened to Tommy D. Simone, but I am here to clear that up. Tommy D. Simone was killed in a kitchen by Jimmy Burke. That was the reality of it. It was Jimmy Burke's problem. Tommy wasn't a made guy, but it was Jimmy Burke's problem. Jimmy Burke brought him in. Jimmy Burke groomed him. He had known uh, Jimmy Burke had known Tommy D. Simone his whole entire life. Tommy got reckless. It was time to go, time to clean up the act. And that's essentially what happened. That is exactly what happened. Uh, and that's the reality of it. Uh, and, and as we go along here in the story a bit, you will see for yourself why that was probably valid. So let's talk about the robbery. Uh, let's take it step by step of what happened. There was a van containing the robber, uh, six robbers. Oh, excuse me. I have to back up one second. You've got to pardon me uh, because I was talking about JFK. I got lost in my own tracks here. Uh, so essentially, JFK, like I said, was split between the Lucchese crime family, Paul Vario, and in the Gambino crime family. At the time, John Gotti was directly responsible for controlling the airport on behalf of the Gambinos. So Jimmy Burke goes to John Gotti and asks for permission to do what they have to do at the airport. Uh, he offers $250,000 to the Gambinos and to John Gotti, but John Gotti in return says, that's fine, but I want Paolo LaCastri to be the sixth gunman. That way, it's going to ensure that our interests are covered. Jimmy Burke didn't have a problem with that, and that was the extent of the Gotti and Burke relationship right there. Gotti wanted his end. He wanted a six-shooter to be in the van so that their business interests were taken care of, and that was it. Jimmy Burke had no problem with that. So uh, a van containing six robbers arrived at the cargo hold at 3 a.m. at JFK Airport. Three men get out of the van and enter the door at the cargo hold. The two men left in the van drive the van to the rear of the building. They cut the lock on the security fence and replace it with one of their own locks. The robbers, all armed and ready, enter and rounded up 10 employees at gunpoint. 3 a.m. was 3 a.m. was lunchtime at the terminal, uh, so the majority of the workers were in the cafeteria. Uh, the crew essentially had had inside information the whole time, so they knew how many employees were going to be there, where they were going to be at what time, how to move around the building, so everybody was accounted for. Uh, every single employee was handcuffed and then forced in, onto the floor. They then forced the shift manager to deactivate the silent alarms as well as the alarms within the vault. They then forced him to open and walk inside the vault. He was then forced to open the cargo bay door, which he did. So they essentially take the shift manager, deactivate all the alarms, open up all the doors, open up the cargo door, and that was the extent of how this was working. The van ends up pulling in, and all six men end up loading the van with jewelry uh, and millions of dollars in different denominations, be it Franks, Deutschmarks, uh, Lira, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At 3.40 in the morning, the van leaves the lot and travels to Massapeth, Queens, where Jimmy was waiting. Uh, the money was switched to a third car, which was driven by Jimmy and his son, Frank. The rest of the crew left. Stax Edwards was supposed to take the van and drive it to New Jersey and have it compacted. So it took an entire 40 minutes for them to rob 60, or excuse me, 60, between five and eight million dollars. They had inside information. Everything was hook, line, and sinker, and it was one of the biggest heists ever. And you can see how they got away with it. They were smart. They got, excuse me, they got in, they got out. Uh, and having all the inside information in the world helps. Now, what ends up taking place afterwards is like another notch on the belt for Jimmy Burke. Uh, not only was he involved in the drug trafficking with Henry Hill, now he's just robbed. <laughs> Effectively, he has uh, been the mastermind behind the, the Lufthansa heist. Uh, and one of the problems Jimmy had was he never thought – 
that they would really ever acquire more than $2 million. He knew that going in, you know, perhaps there's $2 million, maybe a million and a half. And so you figure he's going to spread the money around. Everybody will get a, a really small payday, but it'll be worth it. But what ends up happening is he realizes how much they've really stolen, and he, gets, he starts to become truly paranoid. Uh, he was afraid somebody would rat or other organized crime, crime families that weren't involved in this would find out and want to cut. Even though the airport didn't belong to them, that's an awful lot of money to be carrying around with a lot of eyes and a lot of ears. Uh, and then Burke ends up really getting pressed by everybody that was involved in this. Uh, they wanted their cut. Now, where this really comes into play, especially if you like the movie Goodfellas, is when Maury when Maury's like, Jimmy, I want my money, I want my fucking money, and, and Jimmy's losing it. Uh, and then he's got people that are going out and, and um, buying cars and furs and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but what essentially really is the truth about it at the end of the day is that Jimmy just wanted everybody to shut up. You know, and when you start looking at the amount of money they stole and the amount of money that's got to be spread around, you know, what likely goes through Jimmy's head is now, wait a second. You know, I thought this is going to be a $2 million score. And effectively, I've got $6 million. So that means everybody's cut. Everybody's cut is going to go up tenfold. And Jimmy didn't want to share the money. Believe me, he didn't want to share the money. And the only way that Jimmy could control everyone nitpicking and, and coming after him for their end of it is to get rid of them. You have six guys, too many people know, and Jimmy's only got one method and one way of, of disposing of that issue. And that's murder. And unfortunately, regardless of whether you want to believe that or not, the, the, the true fact is, is that what happened afterwards and you can remember the sequence in, in, in Goodfellas, is people start disappearing. And for good reason. People can't talk. Nobody can tell. Keep it tuned right here. We're going to be right back, and we'll wrap it up with Jimmy Burke. Hey, welcome back to Mob Talk. We are talking about Jimmy Burke. So, beginning right after the Lufthansa heist, bodies start showing up. People start disappearing. Louis Cafora, who was one of the shooters uh, in the van, and his wife Joanna 
were reported missing in 1979. Their bodies were never found. Robert McMahon and Joe Monry, who were a part of the shooting team, were found shot and dead and found in the back of their Buick Electra in Brooklyn of May of 1979. Paolo Castri was found shot and half naked and on fire in a garbage strewn parking lot in Brooklyn, June 13, 1979. Teresa Ferrara, cosmologist, coke dealer, and mistress of Tommy De Simone and Paul Iverio, was found murdered February 10, 1979. Her dismembered torso was found in the waters off Barnegat Inlet. Uh, Burke essentially found out that she was a FBI informant, was feeding information to the police, and he dispatched of her. Uh, Thomas Monteleone, who was an Italian uh, Canadian mobster who ended up borrowing $250,000 from the Lufthansa heist to attain, uh, he was in a deal with Richard Eaton to attain drugs, and essentially the drug deal didn't work out. They owed Jimmy Burke 250000 and Jimmy Burke. Uh, decided that both of them needed to be killed. And uh, of consequence, Richard Eaton was the only murder that Jimmy Burke was ever accused of. Uh, well, not accused of, but ever convicted of. Uh, so, you know, as we see, Jimmy Burke doesn't want any loose ends and starts killing everybody. Uh, in 1980, Henry Hill is arrested for drug tra trafficking. He ends up becoming an FBI informant as a result. Um, Jimmy Burke had repeatedly warned Henry Hill to sort of knock it off. Uh, dial it back a little bit. Henry Hill didn't want to listen, eventually gets caught. Uh, and Lewis Werner, who was the inside guy at the Lufthansa heist, ends up getting scared and becomes an informant. Uh, and what ends up happening is in 1980, Burke is arrested. By 1982, he was convicted in the uh, Boston, point, Boston College uh, point shaving scheme, which Henry Hill takes claim for, which isn't true. That was a Jimmy Burke scheme. Uh, where they paid Boston College basketball players to point shave, and they made an absolute killing. Uh, but ultimately, Hill's testimony gets Jimmy Burke sentenced to 20 years in prison. Uh, two years later, while he's serving time, he gets convicted of the murder of Eaton based on the testimony of Henry Hill, which ends up giving Jimmy Burke a life sentence. Now, Jimmy Burke effectively would have gotten out of prison in 2004, uh, probably out of parole. He would have been, I think, 72 or 74 years old. But on April 13th, um, 1986, uh, at age 64, Jimmy Burke dies in prison of cancer at the Wend Correctional Facility. Uh, and like I said, had he lived, he would have easily gotten out of prison. Uh, that's the story of Jimmy Burke. Now, I know that's a very, very short, condensed version of Jimmy Burke, but the reason why I did that is because I have a, a bunch of other things I kind of want to say about this story, especially about Henry Hill. Uh, in terms of Jimmy Burke, uh, if we really look at the character he is, if, if we take it on its face value and we believe everything the FBI says and everything uh, that the testimony was of Henry Hill, then, then virtually you could say that Jimmy Burke was a psychopath. I happen to believe that's not the case. I think especially when you look at, at Jimmy Burke's childhood and how he grew up and, and it, it just – I don't know. It's just not an easy thing to kind of look at. I think anytime you see a kid that's been abused, it's going to have damaging effects that are going to, you know, last throughout your lifetime. Uh, and ultimately, that doesn't lend itself to the excuse of breaking the law and murdering people. But that's, you know, the the life is such that you are going to do certain things up and down the line. Uh, and I'm not justifying one thing over another. Uh, but Jimmy Burke was very well respected. Uh, he was very well. Uh, mannered in, in, in terms of how he dealt with uh, mob families in general. Uh, there was a reason why Jimmy Burke was never killed. There was a reason why Jimmy Burke was allowed to do what he did. And that's because Jimmy Burke not only was feared, he was respected, and he could earn. He had all three of those things. And we've talked about this before on other mob shows. Uh, either you have to be able to earn, you just got to be able to kill. Or really, that, those are the two options. You know, but Jimmy Burke was feared. Jimmy Burke could earn, and Jimmy Burke would kill. Uh, now, as far as Goodfellow goes, and I know there's going to be some people that are going to mention the spider murder, and I, I'm not covering that, uh, even though it happened in the basement in Robert's Lounge. Uh, to me, it's just not valid. That's Henry Hill's uh, word for it. Uh, you know, and, and I just – I I – I'm trying not to go to a certain place because there's a place I can go where I this would make a lot more sense to people. But I think for the time being, I think any 
sort of Henry Hill anecdotes that I could probably give you. I, I'm just not going to go into, but let, let's just leave it at this, that I spent a little bit of time with Henry Hill uh, a long time ago. Uh, and I don't want to get into the details as to why or what was going on. Uh, but I got to know Henry Hill a little bit. And let me tell you this about Henry. Henry's the biggest liar, the biggest conniver, the biggest alcoholic and junkie I've ever met in my life. If there was a scam, he was in on it. He never stopped scheming, never stopped ripping people off. That's the kind of guy he was. Now, what has been made of Goodfellas in Nick Pelleggi's book and obviously the Scorsese film uh, is that Henry Hill was some mob powerhouse. And that's essentially not true. And the reference point I want to make as much is I don't want to use this reference, John A. Light. Uh, John A. Light and Henry Hill are different, but John A. Light and Henry Hill are the same exact sort of archetype. Uh, and I say that because both are full of shit. Both have lied consistently about who they were, made themselves out to be bigger than who they are, when the reality is they were nickel and dime shit heels. And that's the reality. Uh, Henry Hill grew up in the life. Henry Hill was brought around mob guys. He knew Paul Vario. Even though he was closer to Lenny Vario and Tootie, Lenny, uh, Tootie Le uh, Le uh, Vario, he wasn't as close to Paulie as the film would like to project. Paulie kept him at arm's length, and there's a reason why. Henry Hill would steal anything that wasn't locked down. Uh, was Henry Hill a tough guy? No. Uh, was Henry Hill a murderer? No. But I don't believe a word of his. He never murdered nobody. And, and that was the one thing that I can verifiably say. Uh, I don't think that there's any way, especially with the amount of murders that were attached to, say, Jimmy Burke, Henry Hill, uh, Tommy DeSimone, and Angelo Seppi. I don't think there's any way Hill did not participate in those. Uh, he can and, – and maybe it's not even he can. He could have because he's dead now, but he, he, could, he could try to arrange that any way he wants. But I don't think there's any way that Henry Hill could have been around all that and that he wouldn't have become a marked man much sooner. Uh, now, one of the things that Henry Hill had gone on and said was that Jimmy Burke had attempted to uh, essentially rape, torture, and kill his wife, Karen Hill. That's a complete fucking lie. Uh, that was fabricated by Henry Hill, much like we've seen other informants do, to give themselves some sort of self-justification as to why they become rats. They can't do the time. They don't want to go to prison. So what's more, let's let's make this guy seem a little more serious than he really is. Uh, I'm petrified of him, and, and this way I'll be able to uh, get my ass out of prison. And, and that's essentially what Henry Hill did. The idea that he lamented at the end of the film about his life and what have I become. Listen, he knew full well what he was doing. Uh, he was not involved in the Lufthansa heist whatsoever. To my knowledge, he didn't even get a kickback from that because it had nothing to do with him. Uh, at, that, at that point, Henry Hill was full, full-time full junkie, selling drugs, and a lot of guys like Burke and Vario, they kept him on a leash. They didn't trust him. And that's the one thing that Henry Hill doesn't tell anybody. He wants you to think he was in on a Lufthansa heist. He wants you to think that he was in on this and this. But yet he never murdered anybody. So he was a gangster. You did all this stuff. But, oh, you had this compunction about murder. You just wouldn't do it. Sorry, I don't believe it. It's just not possible. You cannot be involved in that life, be around guys who are essentially committing murder, and not be a part of it in any sense of the word. Maybe that's what he needed to tell himself to get through the night. But the end result is I sat across from this guy in a room, and I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, and I could be wrong, but my opinion, this guy murdered people. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that because I want to sound tough or I want to try to make him into something he's not. But that guy was haunted for a reason. Uh, he was a rat and informant. I don't like him. Yes, 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 and all of that. But believe me, there's there's a guy that saw some stuff and did some stuff he wasn't willing to talk about. He slipped up on interviews and, and said he took part in murders and stuff like that. And even the grandiose uh, egomaniac that Henry Hill was, uh, the suffocant, the guy that thinks he's more than he really was, that's not a guy that's going to interject himself in a murder. Uh, I'll leave that up to some other idiots who do that, but Henry Hill wasn't that type of guy. Uh, so... Do I think it's safe to say on a certain kind of level 
that Henry Hill effectively lied about Jimmy Burke? I think he did. I think he made up a lot of stuff. I think, but more so than anything, Henry Hill elevated his own status and tried to elevate his own status. But it, but essentially, he took down the fucking mob. He took down Jimmy Burke. He took down Paul Vario. He couldn't stop selling drugs. Couldn't stop stuffing the shit up his nose. Got reckless. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, the reality of him becoming an informant really didn't have anything to necessarily do with he was tired of the life. Because this is – we talked about this yesterday when I did the Q&A, which can be found uh, on our YouTube channel. You cannot tell me <laughs> for any reason – and I'm not going to get on this rabbit trail again. But you just can't tell me that at any point you get tired of the life, you don't want to live that life no more, it's bad for you. And then all of a sudden you have some like – some kind of moral epiphany well if you want to have a fucking moral epiphany go to jail don't rat nobody out having a moral epiphany doesn't mean you got to tell on everybody but the reality in his situation was that he knew jimmy burke would kill him he knew he was breaking the the rules he knew he was getting sloppy he was getting reckless with the women the booze the drugs he knew about lufthansa he knew about at least a dozen or so more murders. So he had to go. And he would have gone. So do I buy any of the whole Jimmy Burke going after his wife? I don't believe that for a second. Jimmy Burke wasn't that kind of guy. If he had a problem with you, he, he took it out on you. He didn't need to go touch your wife. He didn't need to go touch your children. So the fact that Henry Hill would, would make the accusation that Jimmy Burke was going to hurt his children is as, pretty much as, as despicable and as low as it gets. That's a man doesn't even do that. That's what a coward does. So that's exactly why Henry Hill said some of the stuff he said. If he can make Jimmy out to be a bigger monster than he actually is, rather than hold himself accountable for his own fucking actions, then guess what? He doesn't have that much to say about Jimmy Burke. He can emphasize it by saying, "Oh, he's gonna—he tried to kill and rape my wife." Blah 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 blah. Karen Hill's never said that. His kids have never said that. In fact, what's amazing is Henry Hill, in any interview he's ever given, whether it's the drunk episodes he did on Howard Stern or some of the other little documentaries that are out, he doesn't seem to mention any common knowledge about murders. You see past informants, they'll talk about it. This guy doesn't. So you kind of got to look at it and just say to yourself, is this guy being legit? And the truth is he wasn't. He was an associate, nothing more. Uh, he was a hangaround guy. He got involved in some stuff, but by all accounts, Henry Hill was not a fucking earner. All the money Henry Hill ever fucking made came from somebody else, from him being around the right people at the right time. Believe me, he didn't do any of it himself. So uh, the author, Nick Pileggi, who wrote Wise Guy, which turned into Goodfellas, uh, he took him at his word, and, and, and that's fine because at the time, there really wasn't anybody around like Henry Hill. And Goodfellas will always stand the test of time because it is a good story. But that's exactly what it is. It's a story because the reality is Joe Pesci's character who played Tommy D. Simone, he was he was a reckless psychopath. But he wasn't that as important. Henry Hill played the the, the Ray Liotta plays his character was sort of important. But really, honest to God, at the end of the day, what made what made that crew what it was was the intelligence of Jimmy Burke. Had nothing to do with Henry Hill. Had nothing to do with Tommy D. Simone. In fact, I was really willing to be go to go so far as to say without Jimmy Burke, Henry Hill's a fucking nobody. He was a nobody anyway. But without Jimmy Burke, he never would have been anybody. Jimmy Burke was the smart one. Jimmy Burke was the intelligent one. Jimmy Burke's the one that did the stuff. And Jimmy Burke, away from that, by all accounts, was a very good man. Now, we can argue the morality of what he did for a living all day long. But the truth is, he was a good man away from that. He took care of his family, took care of his kids. And this is a guy that had a horrible childhood. But once again, I'm not making excuses for behavior. But if we're going to sit there and listen to how Henry Hill has repeatedly described him, it just doesn't make sense. And I think Henry Hill had every reason in the world to be feared or to, to be afraid of, of Jimmy Burke because he knew, he knew what Jimmy Burke would do to him. And at the end of the day, Goodfellas will always be a, a good movie because it's a story. It's a fucking story.
And if you believe everything that that film represents, then you don't know who Jimmy Burke was. You obviously have not figured out who Henry Hill was. But the reality is Jimmy, Jimmy Burke was the guy. He was the guy beloved in Queens. There was not a single person that could say a, a nasty thing about Jimmy Burke. One, because they feared him, but two, because he did the right thing by people. And when you get involved in that life and you're dealing with a certain set of rules that are known, that's the reality of the life. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying, you know what, we've said this a million times in every show, you know what you're getting involved in. You just know what you're getting involved in. And it's a shame that Jimmy Burke didn't get out of prison. And it's a shame that, that he got cancer and suffered. I feel bad for his family. Uh, his life was obviously cut short. I, I honestly do believe that half of what I do know is true. The other half of what I do know is falsified by Henry Hill and padded by other rats and informants. And that sort of leads me to this like final little diatribe. And once again, I, you know, I apologize if I didn't go too much in depth with, with Jimmy Burke, but I, but I have to get through a lot, uh, a lot of information. And I, I don't have a two and a half, three hour show where I can go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, and J. That's just the reality. But I hope you got something out of Jimmy Burke. But, but it leads me to this final point, uh, about the lifestyle and about rats and about informants is that, Nobody stops and takes into consideration that informants lie or that the FBI allows them to tailor the testimony. I, I have seen literally, and this is no joke, cases upon cases upon cases where an informant will tell three different stories. The government wants this, this, and this. Take the case of John Gotti, and I'm only using this as an example. They wanted John Gotti so bad they were willing to let a punk with 19 murders walk. Where's the justification in that? You don't let a child molester walk. You don't let a rapist walk, but you're going to let a guy who has more bodies than a serial killer walk? And for what? To get John Gotti? <laughs> and so here's my thing. Informants lie. What reason do they have to tell the truth? Sure, they tell the truth for about 4% of everything that they say. They'll give them just enough to get a deal they want so they don't have to go to prison, and then they'll just start making shit up. They have no problem making shit up. Henry Hill did it. John A. Light did it. Joe Valachi did it. Sammy Gravano did it. Do I need to keep going on? Tommy Del Giorno did it. Ralph Natale did it. That's what they do. Because guess what? Sometimes the information you have just isn't enough. And especially if you consider, and Gravano is a little different to the extent of he was in a very, very high position in the Gambino crime family. But then you take an average shitheel like a John A. Light or a fucking Henry Hill and they're nobodies. They don't have that information. But what they will do is make up that information. And as long as it fits the government's narrative to get the bigger fish out of the pond then that's exactly what they're going to do. That's not a moral thing. You know how many times I've seen people say, he's a hero, he helped the fucking United States government. He's not a hero, he's a fucking rat. A hero takes his medicine, does his time, and doesn't ruin families. And that's the final point I want to make. Nobody takes into consideration what it does to the children, the grandchildren, the nieces, the nephews, the cousins, the aunties, the uncles, the aunts. Nobody takes into consideration what it does to these families. You know what? Your father did this. Your grandfather did that. Your uncle did this. Your uncle did that. Okay, that's, that's hard enough that you have to live with that. You have to reconcile to yourself at some point. Somebody did something very awful that you love very much. Then you have to suffer watching someone who didn't even know your family make up lies and make up shenanigans and bullshit because they just want to get more time off their sentence. That's more damaging than the truth itself. The truth is a hard thing to, to acknowledge in that lifestyle. Put yourself in, in the Gotti situation. 
be an angel, Victoria, Peter, John. Talk to the O'Kane family. Ask them how they feel. Look at anybody who's ever been testified against and the amount of lies that are told about the people that they love. And there's no denying that the people that they love have done things that, that just aren't cool or have done things that are illegal. That's, that's hard enough to come to terms with that. Then you got the meteor, you got authors, you got fanboys, fangirls, suffocants, rats, snitches, snitch lovers, and they all say the same thing. Imagine how damaging that's got to be. It's not an easy thing to live with. It's very hard. And that's why I respect people that uh, come out and fight the media and say, no, my father wasn't like this, my uncle wasn't like that. Get the story right. And people have a tendency of looking at that like they're egomaniacs and, you know, they somehow support what their loved ones did. But at the end of the day, it's not about that. It's simply about lies, compel lies, compel lies, compound lies, compound lies, and the lies just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Look at Johnny White. He can't go three seconds without saying John Gotti Jr. That's what he does because that's all he's got without the Gotti name. He's a fucking nobody. He's a fucking nobody. And that's the truth. And I will scream that from the heavens. So in final, here's the point. Don't listen to Henry Hill. Don't take the words of rats. Or from the FBI, for that matter. And I could point to a million cases. Greg Scarpa, John Connolly, Whitey Bulger. Uh, even in Philadelphia, it's happened. Do I need to keep going uh, with Ron Previty? Do I need to keep going? Stop snitching. Stop believing snitches. And I really think that the federal government should have to prove a case, not based on the words of a rat. Prove it because you got evidence, not because Joey, Tommy, and Vito want a rat because they can't do time in prison. They have no problem dropping the soap in their own house, but they don't want to do it in prison. So that's all we got for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope Jimmy Burke was enough for you. Uh, I do want to do another show on Jimmy Burke that's a little more in-depth, but for now it is what it is. So I want everybody to have a good weekend. Find something fun to do. If you're in New York City like I am, enjoy the city. It's beautiful out. And uh, avoid them rats at all costs because you never know. Rats got great hearing and they got great vision, but I tell you what, they lie. Their lips lie. Their tongues should turn black with the lies they tell. Have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see everybody next week.